Hello everyone, this is Silver De La Rosa and I welcome you again to my channel on Silver Screen, where learning is interesting. We are now at episode 9 of our procurement and tendering season, and this is the third part of our tender process series. Please support this channel by liking the video and sharing the video to your friends. After all, knowledge needs to be shared. And if you haven't done yet, please subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification bell so that you will be notified once I upload a new video. Our objectives for this discussion is to know the necessary actions that needs to be undertaken during the tender analysis. Here we will discuss the methods of tender analysis such as the lowest price compliant bid and the best value for money analysis. Also, we will talk about the equalization and normalization of tender. We will discuss what is it that you have to look for when you normalize a tender. What items should be normalized and how to normalize these items. And lastly, we will talk about the post-tender interviews. Our primary reference for this discussion is the RICS Guidance Notes on Tendering Strategies, first edition. Now let us begin. Tender analysis is a rigorous process to identify the most suitable tender offer and contractor to carry out the works. The process is also known as tender assessment, tender evaluation, and tender adjudication. Now, in order to look for this most suitable tender offer, there are several analyses or methods of analysis that can be used. One of them is the lowest price compliant bid. So basically, this is just the lowest price that you receive as long as the price complies to your requirement. Now, this lowest price compliant bid may still be applicable for a simple supply contracts. This method of analysis may not provide the best value for money when it comes to construction contracts. Because for complex contracts such as the construction, money or the price is only one of the deciding factor. There are still a lot of factors that you need to consider and we are going to discuss these factors in the succeeding slides. Also, with this method of analysis, the contractor may have a tendency to submit a low price and find ways to charge more once the contract is secured. So in the end, if you're only considering the lowest tender price and you did not consider the other factors or the other priced item that was submitted, it may end up that you will be spending more on the project. Now, another method to analyze the tender is what we call the best value for money analysis. This is also known as MEAT or M-E-A-T. MEAT stands for Most Economically Advantageous Tender. This is also known as PQM or Price Quality Method of Analysis. This is a tender assessment approach that considers the price and non-priced aspect of the tender in order to determine the bid that offers the best value for money. Now here we are talking about the price and non-price. These are the items or the deciding factors that I've been talking earlier. Let us uh, talk more about the best value method of tender analysis. To determine the bid that offers the best value for money, this method of tender analysis is usually done in three phases. The first phase is the analysis of compliance. The second is the analysis of tender quality. And the third phase is the analysis of tender price. So if you can see here, price is only the last phase or the third phase of tender analysis. We have to take note that in cases where tendering is on best value basis, the criteria or sub-criteria and their respective weighings relative to the price must be set out, identified or confirmed in the invitation to tender. What are the actions that we need to undertake when we analyze a tender offer for its compliance? Or what are we looking for in order to determine that the tender is a compliant or a non-compliant offer? A tenderer who submits a qualified tender should be given an opportunity to withdraw the qualifications in order to produce a compliant tender, but without amending the price. So here we are looking at the qualifications in order to determine whether the tender offer is a compliant or non-compliant tender. For example, a contractor had written not included in one of the requirements set out during the tender. This now makes the tender offer a non-compliant offer because it cannot be compared to other complete offer in a like-for-like -like basis. 
The danger of awarding the project to a non-compliant offer is that the cost of compliance becomes variable and may drastically increase the project cost in the end. So what are you going to do? You have to give a, the tenderer who submit a non-compliant tender a chance to withdraw this qualification. And if the tenderer refuses to withdraw the qualifications, then the tender may need to be rejected or his offer needs to be rejected. Now, let us analyze the tender for its quality. What are we looking for when we analyze for tender quality? The quality criteria may be determined from the analysis of client's requirement, the design team's requirement, the tender committee, or inputs from other stakeholders that are involved or will be benefited by the project. The quality criteria may include but not limited to the approach or does the tenderer fully understood the tender process or the requirement of the project. Human resources, so who are their staff? Who are the personnel that they will be assigned to the project? What are their qualifications? Management procedures, subcontractor and supply chain, external relations and community benefits. This is uh, particularly for government project, this aspect is important. Design proposals in the case of design and build procurement route. Technical capabilities. So are there, are the company has enough equipment to carry out the project or does the company or the contractor had carried out the same magnitude of project before? Are they technically capable of doing your project? Sustainability. Now, this criteria and sub-criteria will be given a score that has been established. And different projects may adopt different scoring techniques. We will talk more about the scoring techniques on the next video. And you have to take note that it is imperative that the established scoring technique will be observed strictly. Let us now talk about the analysis of tender price. Once the tender offer had been received, the tender offer should be reviewed against arithmetical errors, then prices and rates shall be normalized. To learn more about the procedures in initial review of tender offers, please visit my previous video in Tender Process Part 2, that is Season 2, Episode 8. Now, what do we mean when we say prices and rates shall be normalized? Let us now talk about the equalization and normalization of tender. The normalization of financial aspect of the tender returns is perhaps the most complex part of the tender analysis. And this requires someone highly skilled and experienced in reviewing tender returns to properly analyze them. What is it that you're looking for when you normalize or when you equalize the tender? Upon analysis, if there are any particular rates or costs that seem to be extremely out of place or unduly high or unduly low, then the tender's attention should be drawn to this particular item and they should be given a chance to confirm or explain the apparent disparity. So what are these items? Where to look out for these items? Or what items should be normalized? These are from the schedule of works, schedule of rates, day work rates, provisional sums. You may wonder why provisional sums. In the event that one of the tenderer raise its concern about the sufficiency of the provisional sum, and as a result, the provisional sum will be changed, then this change should be applied to all the tender returns. So that is why provisional sums should also be normalized. Preliminaries and overhead and profits. So mostly these are priced items. Now, how to normalize these items? There are a number of methods and techniques at the disposal of a quantity surveyor to normalize the tender. And some of these are using an average of the submitted cost, using the highest price from the tender returns, or the use of cost plan allowance for a particular element. We have to take note that each method has its own advantages and disadvantages, and there is no correct method or there, there is no single correct method. The key is to be consistent in the application. How to normalize 
a design and build tender offer. Because what we have discussed earlier are all priced items provided by the tender committee. So now the thing is, for a design and build offer, the tender committee will just be, will give the contractor a client's requirement or a client's brief. And the contractor will return with their tender offer based on their interpretation of the client's brief or the client's requirement. So how are you going to normalize a design and build tender offer? Design and build contractors will include the risk allowance within their tender return. And this should reflect the completeness of design and residual risk. Residual risk meaning the risk that will remain to the client. It is prudent to include a risk register in the tender documents, clarifying which risk the contractor is expected to take forward and which risk remains with the client. The risk register can then be used to base their priced risk allowances. And then this can be normalized in a similar fashion to the work's cost. For example, a tenderer has excluded a key risk that the other tenderers have priced. This can be addressed by either, first, with a client's agreement, the particular risk may be excluded from all tenders, or the tenderer who has excluded it will be given a chance to include a price for taking the particular risk. Now, let us talk about the normalization of overheads and profits. The contractor should be made to split their percentage rate to show the amount of overheads and the amount of profit. Any unreasonably low overhead and profit percentage can raise a valid query about how the contractor hopes to make profit on the project. So remember, having a low profit is uh, submitted by the contractor is not always good. The contractor has to explain why the profit is only at this margin. Let us now talk about post tender interviews. The post tender interviews are a chance to properly understand the tenderer's proposal and raise any in-depth queries that could not be practically answered by correspondences such as construction detailing, program logic, method statement, understanding of cost, and etc. You have to take note, however, that Post-tender interviews should only take place once the initial queries and equalization process has taken place. Now, how to prepare for post-tender interviews? First, prepare the interview structure. The structure of tender interview should be agreed in advance and all tenderers invited to interview should be given the same structure and the same outline queries. Although it is accepted that there will be some questions that are specific only to certain contra contractors or tenderers. Next, prepare the interviewing team. It is also important to agree in advance which team members should attend the interview. This will differ depending on the type of tender and the type of procurement route. For example, in a two-stage tender, the tenderer may be interested to meet the team that is in charge for negotiation in the second stage. And most importantly, record the interview outcome. Any agreement made during the tender interviews should be confirmed in writing and the correspondence may become part of the contract documents. Any significant information that could change the whole basis of the tender should be given to other tenderers for them to respond accordingly. This is very important in order for you to have a like-for-like -like basis of tender analysis. Join me next on Silver Screen as I deliver to you the fourth and final installment of our tender process series. Please support this channel by liking the video and sharing the video to your friends, especially those who are preparing for their APC. And if you haven't done yet, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and turn on the notification bell so that you will be notified every time I upload a new video. Thank you for watching and see you next episode.